Okay, uh, I want to continue with our discussion of section eight <clears throat> of the first essay of Derrida's Rogues. Um, last time I managed to get through a portion of one sentence. Uh, sorry. This time uh, I promise I'm going to get through six pages, uh, pages 80 to 86. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to go through it uh, more, more or less in the order he goes through it. Um, so remember, he's, he's, been, he's introduced this as this section by saying he wants to talk about this um, notion of rogue states that uh, uh, has become pronounced in American and other kinds of political discourse since uh, roughly the end of the Cold War. And so, and he says to untie that knot, he, he's going to take, take up three, th three threads. And this is now the first one that we're going to talk about. And this is going to be a, focusing on this notion of the democracy to come. Um, and he's going to talk about that pretty directly in a couple of pages. But, to, but to, to get there, he leads up to a little bit um, talking about Kant. And at the beginning, uh, on page 80, near the beginning of that section, actually the beginning of the second paragraph, he says, um, it is only in post-Kantian modernity that the problematic, and first of all, the definition of democracy, comes to be rooted in the turbulent terrain of relations between states. So, uh, you know, when we, when the word and notion of democracy was invented, right, it was a, it was a matter for the city-state, for the city in ancient Greece. Um, uh, subsequently, uh, became a bigger issue. And, you know, he talks about Rousseau's writing, where it seems in certain ways like it's an issue at the level of a nation, or nation state. Nonetheless, he says, even in Rousseau, is, he still talks about it kind of at the level of the city. Um, Rousseau aside, uh, I just want you to think about that idea, right? You can think of democracy at the level of the city state. You can think of democracy at the level of the nation state. Right? And that's, those are already quite different things. Uh, but what he says is that from the time of Kant, which is basically the same as saying from the time of the French Revolution, um, the, the urgent focus of democracy, the place where uh, significant things have really been happening, is at the level of the relationships between states. Right? It becomes an interstate issue rather than an intrastate issue. Um, and so he refers to Kant because uh, Kant, uh, in his... Uh, essay on perpetual peace which is from i think 1795 and from his essay on um, cosmopolitanism and the uh, universal history which is from a roughly the same time period i can't remember the exact date 1790s uh, in those essays Kant, you know takes up the great essays and Kant takes up the theme of democracy and and uh, contemporary politics and really uh does bring a focus onto this issue of the relationship between states and um I highly, highly recommend those essays to you, by the way, if you have time to read things. Um, but uh, what Kant says in his analysis there is that you, you, know, you, can have a, you can have a sort of single city government, you can have a sort of single nation government, but, you, but there's something wrong with the idea that you would have a single sort of universal world government. He says the only thing that, that's really going to be viable is if it remains the case that states are kind of individual sovereign states that have a certain kind of federation. And so... Yeah, you can develop certain kinds of um, institutions to address issues of proper behavior between states and so on. But, there, but there'd be something wrong with instituting a single sort of universal government. I'm not, I'm not going to pursue any arguments for that. I just mention that to you as an issue and a thing you should think about. But that's what Derrida is talking about when he, um, when he talks about um, Kant on... Uh, 80 and especially 81, when he emphasizes uh, this notion of a league uh, of peace and so on. Um, so uh, as he says, Kant, uh, this latter alone being capable of assuring a perpetual peace in a federation of free, which is to say sovereign states. So the interesting idea there, um, uh, like I said, I don't want to pursue Kant's particular argument, but I just want you to think about that, right? That, that there, there might be a reason why you'd want there to be a multiplicity of actors, right? You might think that democracy only makes sense if it's a matter of the more than one, right? If it's a matter of negotiating with others, right? We talked about the other of democracy when we talked about chapter three or section three, but in a way, um, uh, there's another inside democracy in as much as it seems like the very nature of democracy, at least one sense of it, as we saw way back when we talked about section one, um, is establishing something with another, right? Uh, 
And uh, let, let me just, another aside, like um, we didn't read section seven. It's quite a good section, but, you know, difficult to. Uh, but there he actually tells you what the two questions are that have been bothering for him from the beginning. And the first is, uh, do you have to speak about democrat democracy democratically? Uh, it's a theme that comes up again in this chapter a little bit. And the other one is, uh, is the democracy to come a god to come? And I think that second one, I mean, there's probably more issues there too, but that second one is sort of about that question of whether uh, the idea of the successful democracy or the ideal democracy would be like everything becomes one, you know. Um, sometimes you might think that's the goal. We want to, you know, our inclusiveness can have the sense of unifying. We want to have the same perspective and so on. Uh, and, and in other words, we want to become the same. Uh, and on that model, you might think uh, uh, something that is perfectly unified would be the model of democracy. So you might think then that the, the notion of God that we have in a kind of, you know, monotheistic sense, uh, sort of the absolute one, you might think that's a, the, that would be your model for democracy. Or you might think the opposite, right? You might think, no, that's kind of the problem. You don't... You, the whole idea of democracy is that you, it's built around the idea of negotiating with differences. But you, but if, if it's negotiating with differences, then you're not, you're not taking as your ideal um, exactly unity or uniformity. You're, you're taking uh, as your basic model that there are going to be legitimate differences. And the question is how to, how to live together with things and others that are different, with others. Um, so... Uh, and anyway, as I said, I want you to think about that as a, as a theme about democracy in general. And as I also said, we did mention that way back when we did it at chapter one. But I, I wanted to bring that back now to this question of international relations, interstate relations, uh, where, the, you know, you could ask yourself from the point of view of a democratic sensibility, would it be desirable to establish a single world government? Or would that be the opposite of desirable? Um, anyway, so that's that's just something to put in your mind as you uh, read through this stuff on eighty to eighty one. But 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 so Derry does point though is you know he says since Kant that's really where the issue has come to be and actually let's just think a little bit about why and it, it relates to the thing I was talking about um, last week when I was talking about d democracy and its kind of missionary character right if you think about the kinds of things that are put forward as democratic um, causes in politics today it, it can very much be that one we've talked about oh we've got to go you know free those muslim women from those oppressive theocratic regimes right uh, in other words the the notion of democracy has a very powerful political charge nowadays for a, focusing on questions of what you might normally call, you know, foreign policy, right? Or, you know, are we going to go to war with those people? Um, and so, so again, for that reason, and, you know, you can, you can see justification for that in the very notion of democracy, uh, even though you might nonetheless significantly distrust the reasons people actually do those things. Uh, but uh, so you can see then in the very notion of democracy, there's a there is inherently a difficulty of, of clearly separating inside and outside. Because the thing that looks like it's outside, you can already kind of say, well, that's inside our question, right? Like, if we're Democrats, we're already concerned about the Muslims. If we're, if we're, uh, if we're Democratic Americans, we're already concerned about the theocratic Muslims, right? If, we're, um, if you're concerned about human rights, you have to be concerned about everybody's human rights, not just your friends or your people in your city, right? And so... Things that from a legal standpoint or from the point of view of national boundaries might look outside, from the point of view of your political values, would seem to be inside, right? And so if your regime is democratic, it, it would seem like it can't disavow concern with those other things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's why then it's hard, it's hard to see, it's, it's hard to say unambiguously, and this will come up uh, later in the chapter, uh, it'll, it's hard to say unambiguously whether an action is uh, a matter of war or a matter of uh, policing, if we think of policing as a kind of uh, internal matter. Um, it's, it's, and, and similarly, he, he says something similar at a later point, like, uh, 
Is it military or is it police? Is it war or is it peace? A little bit of a poem there that I just made up for you. Are you making war or are you peacekeeping, right? You, the point is you should recognize that language, police action. That's what the U.S. called what it was doing in Vietnam. Uh, peacekeeping forces from the U.N., right? The, um, both names for making war in different ways. Uh, but, you know, the very notion of democracy has significance for how you construe those actions and how, how you're going to describe them. Um, anyway, that's just uh, a little bit to, to put that stuff back in your mind. Um, but that, so the point is that, in a way, that's where, that's where the game is right now, right? And so that's why he says on 81 then, as for democracy and the interstate or transstate relations, uh, the law and the institutions of today, uh, the least that can be said is that it remains entirely to come. Right? So in other words, that is where, in a way, the question of democracy is being played out. That's its its latest horizon. But there, that is therefore where, in a way, we're still uh, waiting to realize it. Right? As for democracy there, the least that can be said is that it remains to come. It is, it is thus the place of which we must speak. We don't necessarily speak from that place. We don't necessarily speak in view of that place. But we speak on the, on the subject of the possibility or the impossibility of such a place. So that's, I, I wanted to get to that sentence just because in a way that's, that's helping to define what it is that he's working with here and why he's talking about this epoch of rogue states, right? And, and where his contemporary political analysis is, is then being focused. Um, uh, then the next couple of pages, uh, he more or less goes through and talks about things he has said elsewhere about this notion of democracy to come. And those pages are quite good and they're quite interesting. I'm not going to read through them right now because, um, though there is new stuff I could pull out of them, the basic points he makes are either close to or at least highly resonant with points we've made before uh, about autoimmunity uh, on the one hand and, and the related point about whether democracy includes everybody, including its critics, you know, people who don't understand it, or if, it's, or if democracy only includes Democrats and so on. Um, the, there are some pretty rich interest, issues in there, especially I would say the issue, the particular notion of the secret and the question of whether, you know, we often think of democracy as kind of public. Um, but he sort of brings up a theme here that there's something essential about secrecy, that maybe democracy you should think of as the thing that protects your right to keep secrets. And so there's, a, there's another kind of um, ambivalence in democracy between the uh, commitment to pub publicness and the commitment to preserving the privacy, the right to secrecy. This is another thing you could think about. But like I said, I'm not going to go through that right now, but I hope you can read through it with some sense. That, that I get, actually, I said there's one notion of a secret. The other notion that's kind of significant there is the notion of an inheritance of a promise, but we're going to come back to that. Um, so what I want to get onto now is what starts at the bottom of, of 83. <coughs> you know, he said um, with respect to the interstate relations, like surely you'd have to say democracy is remains to come. And then in these in these uh, little passages he's been looking at from his own earlier work, this this issue has come up again. And so he says, okay, now let's talk about that notion. Is What are we saying democracy is? Is, is? is it an ideal? Is that how we should construe it? And so that's what leads him to talk about the notion of uh, Kant, the notion from Kant of a regulative ideal. Um, now, uh, Kant is a difficult philosophical figure, and if you want to know what he says, you have to read his book, and you have to read it pretty carefully, and you have to spend a lot of years learning from it and thinking about it. Um, so uh, we're not in a position to study Kant carefully right now, and actually neither is Derrida, and that's actually going to be the third of his points. His third point is, um, if I, I'm not, I don't really want to use the notion of a regular ideal in Kant, because if I were going to do it, I'd actually have to get pretty rigorously involved in studying Kant, and I'd have to think, okay, he says this, he says this, he says this. Like, what exactly does he mean by that? So the third of his three points, uh, I think, effectively says that uh, you can't just throw words around like uh, Kant's regular ideal as if it meant something pretty clear and you know what it is and you've nailed it, right? I, I think that his third point is effectively that if you really wanted to find out if what I'm saying is like what Kant is saying about the regulative ideal, you'd have to dig into some pretty serious work of interpreting Kant. Um, and let me make a further small point about that. Uh, Derrida 
uh, as, as he's going to do here in a minute, he's going to say some things about Kant that just sort of reflect the way people commonly talk about it. Um, and in that way, you might think, oh, he's not that, that careful a reader. Um, when he does actually sit down to read a figure in the history of philosophy, he's a very careful reader, much more careful than most people you would usually encounter. And so his third point, I think, is actually a pretty weighty one, that he, like he's actually acknowledging and drawing your attention to the challenge the hermeneutical challenge, the existential challenge of uh, interpreting seriously um, these great works of philosophy. And that might even remind you of a point he made back in chapter three when he said, you know, if you're really going to talk about democracy and Islam, uh, that's going to embed you in a massive and massively important hermeneutical task of really working to understand what the traditional texts of Islam say. Of course you have, you know, the so to speak, church hierarchy, the church isn't quite the right word, but whatever, the religious hierarchy uh, of, of the official Muslim world telling you this is what those texts say and this is what they mean. But um, simply turning to those people and agreeing with what they say is not a high-powered hermeneutical method. Um, and it's certainly by no means obvious that the things those people say are straightforwardly correct interpretations any more than it's obvious that... Uh, what the what the Pope says is a brilliant exegesis of you know Old Testament texts, so-called Old Testament texts. Um, so you know it's a real question: what uh, what do those things say? What has the tradition been? And when you explore the founding documents and traditions of Christianity, you find it's an extremely diverse and extremely interesting tradition that um, has meant a lot of different things and um, offers you know some amazing amazing and brilliant resources for the world and surely the same is true of islam uh, what has is lacking in relationship to islam is the history of uh, that kind of intense uh, research that the that the christian tradition has received um, anyway that was a point he made back in chapter three um, so i want just to, to to draw your attention again to that here like the the derrida is i think very uh, powerful and important emphasis on the hermeneutic demands of taking these things up and so you know he he will say some at some times some fam, you know familiar uh things about whoever heidegger or plato or whatever uh but he's also when he does that he's also usually pretty careful to say yeah these are just the ways people talk whereas when he tries to talk seriously about people he is extremely careful more as i say more so than most people you would encounter and it, so that's his third point so what's his third hesitation for invoking Kant's notion of the regulative ideal, well, it would just be too demanding a thing to do that. He's not, he's not going to do that if he's not actually going to do the work of rigorously reading Kant. Uh, and so you shouldn't either. Um, but so let's go back then to the first two. So, so he says, to, to using that idea, um, he says, to, to this I would, this is on 84, uh, line 6, to this I would oppose in the first place all the figures I place under the title of the impossible of what, what must remain in a non-negative fashion foreign to the order of my possibilities, to the order of the I can. So, what, so when we're talking about the democracy to come, this is the first thing he wants to say, um, are we talking about a possibility? And he says, well, in my language, it's what I would call an impossibility. Uh, but what does he mean by that? Does, does he mean to say, oh, it just can't happen? And he's saying, no, it's, it's not that. He's saying by his, his notion of impossibility, he's trying to name a, something positive about uh, something real. Uh, namely, that that thing he's talking about is not itself an instance of something you could do. Um, in that sense... Uh, justice, I think, is similarly an impossibility because if, for the reason that justice will never be realized in some simple, perfect, present instance. Right? Ju justice is not a, th a thing you could do and then it would be done and then you would have accomplished it. It's not just one of the possibilities. You think, oh, let's get it. Let's get that justice thing. Right? Justice, on the contrary, is... Is a kind of infinite demand and of course you should try to be just and of course you will do things uh, in the name of justice in pursuit of justice in an attempt to realize justice and you know those things might be good that's great 
but none of those things will be just sort of unambiguously success you got it you found what justice is and you did it you know justice isn't just one of the things that might happen in the world like that uh no matter what you did uh there would both be remaining demands and there would be reason to look at what you did and ask you know was that perfect or could we criticize it in some way and surely the answer would be yeah there's you know there are some sides of what you did that make it open to challenge make it open to critique or whatever else um so so when he says the democracy to come as i'm saying about justice here when he says about democracy to come that it's an impossibility he's not saying it's impossible any more than he's saying it's impossible to, to be just in in a everyday sense rather he's saying the very nature of this most real thing this injunction to be just or the unjust injunction to be democratic uh, the very nature of it is that it's it uh, exceeds any possible presence, any possible thing that could be made present, anything you could do in the present, anything that could be presented. Um, it's it's a, that's part of what it means to say it's an infinite demand. It uh, it is it is in a way always being realized when people are trying to be democratic or just and it's also never realized it's never simply made present so um so so that's the first point he wants to make when you're thinking about the democracy to come you you you're already on the wrong foot if you think it's just an it that you could find and you could get and then you'd have it you know, it's very common that people, it seems to me, that people think, oh, if we could just do this, we'd have it. You know, like, if we could just, um, uh, I don't know, have more fixed uh, election procedures in the United States that are overseen by somebody not subject to, you know, revision by a political party or the Supreme Court or something, or if we could just have uh, proportional voting, or if we could just have, you know, like, it seems to me, if we could just get this candidate sometimes even, it seems to me people often think there there is a kind of policy you could name, and if you installed it, you'd be set. Like, if we could, you know, so you might think, oh, I've got the blueprint, I know what we should do, and if they just elect the right person to put those things in place, well, then we'd be set, right? That's what he's denying. He's saying there's no, there's, there's no such thing as the, the fully successful realization of this and in that sense it's not a possibility it's not one of the things you might do right there are many things you might do in the name of it uh, but there will always be more to be done and there will always be problems with the thing you did um, it's not it's not a thing that's going to reach an end in that simple sense um, so that's so so this first, his first uh, 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 response to this notion of the regular ideal uh, on page eighty-four, it's just two paragraphs, may, really makes two points, and that's the first one that if you think, if, so if you want to, know what is, you know, is this the ideal democracy or something like that? Is, is it is it a possibility? No, and, and what that means is it's not going to be a simple present reality. So if you're thinking about the democracy to come, you know. Don't wait for it like you would wait for, you know, the day the right washing machine gets delivered or something like that, right? It's, it's not a thing that might be coming. There is nothing, there is no simple thing that could come that would settle it, right? Um, so in that sense, it's, it's never going to be a present reality. On the other hand, though, he wants to say, and this is then the, um, more or less the... Um, well, there, it is more or less the second point, I guess. It's also not just an ideal, right? Because you could also say, oh, okay, okay. Well, so it's never going to be realized. So what we want to say is like, uh, yeah, it's just, democracy is just kind of an idea. And, and it's, it, we just have to accept all these imperfect forms. But, there, you know, there, there's, a, there's a kind of fixed, uh, I don't know, kind of rational notion we could, we could hold on to and, and et cetera, et cetera, right? That, it's, that it's, a, it's a unrealizable ideal, I guess I could put it that way. Those two oppositions, those two things that he's, he, he's going to deny that too, and I'm going to say why in a second, but the, those, those two, the, the present reality versus the unrealizable ideal, I mean, that's not so far from the basic kind of distinction between sort of what, ra what, what you might think a sort of stereotypic empiricism and a stereotypic rationalism might say. And so if you, know, if you go back to Merleau-Ponty, if you go back to Hegel, if you go back to Bergson, Kant even, 
Uh, one of the things all of those guys do is they they consistently try to show that we we think poorly because we rely on certain um, easy but false ways of categorizing things uh, that that effectively amount to being a rationalist or being an empiricist. Um, and we take up all kinds of problems and either rely on a notion of a kind of uh, independent realm of pure meanings or we rely on a notion of uh, only present realities being real and so on. Um, and all of those guys try to show that those two models both kind of miss the point. And, and they, uh, Kant, Hegel, Bergson, Merleau-Ponty all sort of carry out their philosophizing by saying, well, you know, here's how this empiricist type thing would look at, and that doesn't work for these reasons. Here's how the rationalist kind of thing would look at that issue and what doesn't work for these kind of reasons. And then they try to develop something a little different. And Derrida is doing much the same thing. He's saying, like, the, when it comes to thinking about the democracy to come, you're probably going to flip into thinking about one of these two op alternatives, either an unrealized perfect ideal or a completely realizable present reality. And he's saying both of those are false. Uh, both, both of those significantly fail to understand the kind of reality that we're talking about. Um, and so I've said something that I hope is sort of intuitively clear enough about why it's never going to be a simple present reality. Um, about the ideal, he says, but this impossible is not privative, right? It's, it's, he's not saying it's impossible in the sense that you just can't have it, right? He says, uh, it's, and it's not, a, it's not about ide defining something, but saying it's inaccessible. Um, and it's not something you can always say, well, you know, we, we can't have it. Don't, don't imagine you get that thing, you know, and you could just keep deferring it, you know, because et cetera. He says, on the contrary, it announces itself. It pre precedes me, swoops down upon and seizes me here and now in a non-virtualizable way in actuality and not potentiality. It comes upon me from on high in the form of an injunction that does not simply wait on the horizon, uh, that I do not see coming, that never leaves me in peace, and never lets me put it off until later. Such an urgency cannot be idealized any more than the other as other can. There he's saying, in a way, what's wrong with that notion of an ideal is that you're, you really are saying the thing itself is, is in a separate realm. And he's saying, on the contrary, what we're talking about, as he actually says, I didn't read the next sentence, but he says, we're talking about something that is the most real. We're talking about the thing that is the very heart of your experience of the present. So he says, this impossible is thus not a regulative idea or an ideal. It is what is most undeniably real. Okay. Um, so way back in uh, chapter one, I think he talked about the, the here and now of urgency. And that's really what's coming, coming back. We're coming back to here. Um, uh, basically, I think what you would get out of these two paragraphs and you would also get this if you went back and read chapter 7, uh, or section 7. In section 7, he talks about the democracy to come uh, partially in relationship to Rousseau. And he says the same thing. He says, well, I wouldn't want you quite to think that this is just the same as Rousseau for a variety of reasons. But nonetheless, uh, the things he says about Rousseau are very close to the basic thing he wants to say, which, which are, like here, this, that... Um, there's something about the very meaning of democracy that it is impossible in that sense that it's not um, ever going to be settled in a simple present actuality. Nonetheless, that is not a reason for thinking it is something other than present actuality, as if it, as if it were something else somewhere else, right? On the contrary, it, it, it exists in a way precisely as the urgency emerging from the concreteness of any, whatever particular present situation you're in, the urgency here and now to make this situation uh, respond to and deal with that which is um, presenting itself as, you know, the democratic, the relevant democratic challenge, right? De democracy... He's saying, he says, is that injunction, which speaks to me from on high, uh, uh, you know, of an urgency here and now to do the, do the right thing, to, to um, uh, work within the parameters of the existing situation to make it hospitable to, to that which it's excluding. Right? Um, so, uh, so the, 
the idea of a democracy to come is, is not the notion of a distant, unrealizable ideal, even though it's not the same as the um, some particular present reality. It's rather the uh, d inescapable demand in any present to uh, realize to realize democracy in the unique terms presented by that concrete situation. Um, so I think that's the most important idea then ab about that. And, uh, you know, as you can see from the thing I just said, whatever you, you do, uh, that democracy will remain to come, right? The, the injunction will be there tomorrow too. Um, but anyway, so that's the first one. And I do think that is in a way the the biggest point. So I think if you've understood the thing I said there, I think you've got the, the core of the idea of the democracy to come. Uh, and I, I would encourage you to go back and read Section 7. I'm not, you know, taking us through it, but I think if you read back read back through it, especially after I've said these things, you'd start to see him talking again about some of those points in a helpful way. Uh, but so so that was that was his first the, his first reservation. Well, and I've already told you the third one. The third one is you can't talk about Kant without studying Kant carefully. We're not going to do that right now. Then the first one was, here's the problem with thinking of how we might think about this issue of an ideal. And then the second one is about thinking of it as a, what Kant calls a regulative ideal. Regulative, well, that means rule. And he says, so would this be something that supplies a rule? And his point is no. Um, in the second place, then, the responsibility of what remains to be done or decided, which, which is what that injunction is about, right, cannot consist in following, applying, or carrying out a norm or a rule. Um, whenever I have at my disposal a rule, I know what must, what must be done. Uh, and as soon as such knowledge dictates the law, action follows knowledge as a calculable consequence. Right? That when, when, you, um, when you think of responsibility as rules, then ethics, so to speak, just becomes calculation. And it's something without, without an existential grip. It's just, just following rules, just working things out. Um, as he says, the, the, and in that case, then, the, the decision no longer decides anything because the decision was made in advance by the rule. Um, and in that sense, this is something like the automatism attributed to machines. Right? So that's, that's uh, 84 to 85. So he doesn't pursue that further here. He, you know, it's another one of those themes he's talked about elsewhere. So he was taking up this issue of reg a regulative ideal. And you know, ultimately, I think his point is, despite what he says, what he, what he seems to say, I think his point is, yeah, it's a lot like what Kant means by a regulative ideal. But don't slip into thinking that without working on what Kant says. And here are two ways you, you, you might be thinking about what a regulative ideal is that would take you in the wrong direction. A certain way you could be construing what it is to be an ideal that would be mistaken. Certain, so it's, not, it's not an ideal presence, nor is it a, merely an idea, right? Um, and then on the other hand, when you think about it as regulative, you might think, oh, that means it's a rule. I just have to figure out the rule to follow. No, that's 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 going to miss the point also. Um, so those are the those are the um, those are the three things he says about why he's sort of reluctant to what well, yeah why he he would be reluctant to use that language simply to describe what he's doing. And I hope that through talking through them, I've helped you to get a sense of what the point is. Um, I just want to read uh, a a little bit more now on the bottom of eighty five. He says, so those are some of the reasons why I. Uh, without giving up on reason, without giving up on the idea of an interest of reason, that's language that Kant uses, those are reasons why I hesitate to use the expression regulative ideal. He's not saying it's wrong, it's just these are the things that's, that make me hesitate because these are all pitfalls that could come with, an, with, with someone encountering that language. Um, he said, and he said, he said in another one of his works, he set aside that language and instead insisted at once on the absolute and unconditional urgency of the here and now that does not wait and on the structure of a promise, a promise that is kept in memory, that is handed down, inherited, claimed, and taken up. Um, uh, so I want just to read that passage. And again, I, uh, this relates back then to one of the things I said we'd come back to. Uh, the quotation on the bottom of 82, uh, he's talking about where he's talked about this in another word, and that's where he says, let's take the example of democracy as the inheritance of a promise. And so I just wanted to, to bring out that, or 
underline that notion, right? If you think, so what is what the democracy to come? What do we talk about democracy? What is it? And here he's saying, you know, maybe the way you should think of it is as a promise, a promise of a certain kind, I guess, of liberation, a promise of a certain kind of justice, and and it's a that promise, a promise maybe inherent to the very nature of human relationships. Uh, is something we've inherited. You know, from the very beginning, he said we've inherited this notion from the Greeks. We've inherited the promise even farther back than that. But that, but, but in a way, what is what is democracy? Well, it's the way we live. It, it is it is that promise we've inherited. Uh, the promise of a of a kind of justice of, for people. Um, that inheriting it also almost means like it's like a torch that's handed down to us uh, and we to receive that torch is to experience yourself as um, responsible for that as as uh, responsible here and now to uh, you know be true to that promise something like that um, so so that's it. so I want to I want to leave there I want just to take take you quickly through those um, few pages um, and I hope that both allows you to go through the structure and also gets lets you get a sense of that notion of democracy to come. And I think I especially want to emphasize that two-part structure of the first thing, the critique of the idea of simple presence, but also the critique of the idea of a detached idea or a detached ideal. Um, and so I'll come back again and talk a bit more about uh, further things in the essay. <laughs>